Celebrate Recovery. Now let's get to stepping with ministry leader Paul Pippen. Hello, Internet. Hello, people. Uh, welcome to Celebrate Recovery. My name is Paul. I'm a grateful Christian believer who struggles with codependency. Hi, Paul. Hi, Paul. How are you guys doing? Uh, let's pray, shall we? Thank you so much, Lord, for this uh, beautiful, beautiful night. Thank you for the rain that we had this week. Thank you for the people who are here. And for the people who can't be here, we just ask your blessing on them. Bless our time of fellowship and worship and learning tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. We are um, about to have some fun. Next week, no, not next week, two weeks from now is our CRBQ. Uh, it'll be March 4th will be our CRBQ. So uh, I don't know what's on the menu yet, but it's going to be something. It's going to be good. It's going to be worthwhile. So be here at 630 um, for, uh, for CRBQ, and that will be outstanding. Uh, we have bathrooms out here. Uh, there's uh, one with a picture of a lady with a dress on. That's for the ladies. Guy with pants is the uh, guys. Please use the bathrooms as necessary. We are also online. Uh, people have been reading the blog two weeks in a row. We've had good readership on the blog, so thank you very much for reading the blog. Uh, 9 a.m. on Monday mornings, it comes out. It is ministerofmocha.wordpress.com. And uh, if you're not sure, just text me or Bev and we'll, uh, we'll hook you up there. We're also on Facebook. If you look on the CR page on Facebook, I usually post the blog. And um, this lesson will be up uh, Monday or Tuesday morning as well. Uh, so we shall see. I don't know if it'll be Monday though. Monday's my birthday. I might be might be taking some time to just goof off. Yeah, yeah, it's true. I'm getting older and older. Maybe wiser. Uh, uh, older and more broken down. Uh, do you have someone to do this with you, sir? Do you want to do this with me? All right. Do you want to be a stepper or a? Uh... I'll do the verses. Okay. This is yours. Okay. Uh, tell us who you are. Uh, my name is John, and uh, I'm a Christian believer, and I'm forever in recovery from compulsive behavior. Hi, John. Hi, John. All right. Uh, step one. We have 12 steps. We're a 12-step group, uh, so we have 12 steps here. Step one, we admitted we were powerless over our addictions and compulsive behaviors, well, that our lives had become unmanageable. I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. Romans 7, 18. Step two, we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose, Philippians 2, 13. Step three, we made a decision to turn our lives and our wills over to the care of God. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Romans 12.1 Step 4. We made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Lamentations 3.40 Let us examine our ways and test them, and let us return to the Lord. Step 5. We admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. James 5.16 Step 6. We were entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. James 4.10 Step 7. We humbly asked him to remove all our shortcomings. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1 9. Step 8. We made a list of all persons we had blamed. I'm sorry, we had harmed. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one. That's, apparently, that's the best joke I've told all day, and that's the only one I wasn't trying for. We made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Luke 6.31. Step nine, we may direct amends to such people whenever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother. Then come and offer your gift, Matthew 5, 23 and 24. Step 10, we continue to take personal inventory and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. 
So if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Step 11. We sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and power to carry that out. Let the word of Christ dwell on you richly. Colossians 3, 16. And finally, step 12. Having had a spiritual experience as the result of these steps, we try to carry this message to others and to practice these principles in all our affairs. Brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently, but watch yourself, or you also may be tempted. Galatians 6.1. Fantastic. Thanks a bunch. We're going to sing some songs. I hope I just stepped on my bass while I was doing that. I hope I didn't break it. Because <laughs> you guys know what it's all about, right? It's all about it's all the bass. About bass. Yeah. Yeah. No trouble. Oh. oh, hey, I've got one more announcement while Mark is playing that beautiful little song there. March 8th, um, we're going to be starting step studies for ladies and men. If you're a man, talk to me about it. If you're interested, if you're a lady, talk to Bev about it. And uh, we'll be starting that on Tuesday nights, 6.30 to 8. Yeah. 
she's old school. So it's not ancient old school. I had a kid at, at worship practice the other day. Like, oh, this is old school. It was like from 2005. <laughs> Man, <laughs> shut up. <laughs>
and it's nice when there's lots of people here singing and hollering. Oh, wow. Stop. Oh. Yeah. Oops. Hi, I'm a grateful Christian believer who struggles with codependency and anxiety. My name is Bev. I am. Is that? Oh, that's so exciting! Wow, <laughs> wow. You guys are awesome. Do you ever have that day when you uh, don't think that God's grace is going to be enough for you, and then at the end of the day you put your head down on the pillow and guess what? It was, yeah, so good. Tonight, our um, devotional comes from Celebrate Recovery Bible, page 182. I was right, but just, I had the numbers turn around. Uh, it's entitled, My Name is Moses. Now, we read about Moses last week, um, but I can surely relate to this devotional tonight. The scripture reference is Numbers 20. As our time of sobriety grows longer, it can be hard to remember that we've never be, that we are never beyond our temptations. Numbers 20 records an instance of relapse by one of God's greatest servants. Moses had an anger problem. He heard the complaints of the people about the lack of water and appropriately asked God what he should do. The Lord instructed Moses to speak to a rock, promising that water would flow from it so that the people could drink. Sadly, Moses failed to act according to the centuries later recommendation of Pastor Rick Warren, who counsels each one of us to carry out a regular heart check, asking ourselves daily whether we are H, hurting, E, exhausted, A, angry, R, resentful, or T, tense. Had Moses done this, he might have avoided a relapse into anger that for him turned out to have a life-changing consequence. This wasn't a new experience for Moses either. Exodus 2, 11 through 12 records how his impulsive act of rage led to the murder of an Egyptian, which in turn resulted in 40 years of exile from Egypt. How did Moses end up spending 40 years in the wilderness of Midian? He sinned and tried to keep his guilt and shame a secret. We are indeed as sick as our secrets. After 40 years, Moses was restored to God's service. His patience with a nation of complainers was repeated proof of the reality of his recovery experience. But the danger of relapse isn't erased even by decades of ministry. Moses, as we have seen, was directed to simply speak to the rock. Instead, he tongue-lashed the stubborn Israelites and struck the rock in his fury. I missed that for a lot of years. I didn't, I didn't know what he had done wrong, but that makes sense. God told him to speak to it. He didn't. He yelled at it. Um, the consequences were severe, primarily because Moses was a leader. God placed the limitation on his ministry to God's people. After so many years of faithful service, he wouldn't be the one to lead the people into the promised land. Relapse can be avoided if we consistently take a personal inventory and continuously maintain our conscious contact with God. We'll never outgrow our need to evaluate our spiritual condition or to listen to God carefully every single day. So, it's interesting, I always um, like to let Bev surprise me with what her devotional is going to be, because uh, that's just fun to me. And um, this one was fantastic, because uh, one of my best friends always talks about Moses and that rock. And um, am I on mute? I'm on mute. That's better. Thank you. <laughs> I had someone in the back pointing at their backside. I was like, well... What's happening here? So either Dave has gas or I need to turn on my microphone. <clears throat> Could be both. <laughs> um, so uh, he always says, never strike the rock when you can just speak. Because he had done that for so long. He walked around just smacking rocks. And he said, and only speak what, you know, that that imparts grace into someone's life. It's so easy to just holler and shout and scream and be mad at stuff or things or people. 
that you don't even see. And Facebook makes that super easy, doesn't it? It's nice to just go out and get on a Facebook rant and just tell people, blah, 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 because you're never going to see them. You don't have to deal with it. It's like driving down the road. You can shake your fist at someone. I've never shaken my fist at anyone in the store when they could come and get me. But in the car, I'm always like, you dirty, rotten scoundrel. So that's a, that was a good word. I appreciate that, Bev. Tonight, we're looking at lesson three, which is hope. I hope. Yes, it is. Hope. We're dealing with principle two. Look at this. We're already on principle two. How awesome is that? Now, I want to give you my weekly reminder that this is where I'm preaching because this is where the calendar has me. Do you guys know that this is the third week of February? Did you know we're coming up on the best part of the year? In just three short days, it's going to be my birthday. It's amazing. It's amazing. Just three. Three short ones. And it's, yeah. And we're talking about principle two, and it's the second month. And I was born on the 22nd, so this is like perfect. But this is where we are because of the calendar. Not necessarily meaning this is where you are in your recovery. You might be behind it. You might be ahead of it. It could be a reminder. It could be a look forward. But this is where we're teaching. We'll be teaching this next year when it's three days before my birthday as well. Principle two says, earnestly believe that God exists, that I matter to him, and that he has the power to help me recover. That goes with Matthew 5, 4, the beatitude that reminds us, happy are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Step two says we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Philippians 2, 13. I love the idea of his good purpose. So tonight we're looking at, at this idea of hope. And this is basically principle two in a nutshell. Hebrews eleven six 6 says, anyone who comes to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. And honestly, why would you go to a God that doesn't <clears throat> exist? Why would you go to a God that doesn't reward the people who seek him? What would the point be in going to someone who is fake and if they were real, just punishes you. There's no point. It would be pointless. Psalms. Good old David. We've been doing a study on David on Thursday nights with our worship team and looking at David and Goliath. And it's easy to remember the story of David and Goliath because it's, you know, it's referred to by people all the time. It's like, wow, this is a David and Goliath you know, football game. It can be really easy for me to just gloss over what happened. But we've been spending, well, we're going to spend about 10 weeks looking at David <laughs> versus Goliath. It's amazing. I recommend you go back and take a look at that story and read it slowly. Because it's an epic. I mean, it's a, a, a beautiful, beautiful story. But David wrote these Psalms and he said, Find rest, O oh my soul, in God alone. My hope comes from him. I really like that God alone part. He's not saying, find hope in God. Sometimes. God alone. Nobody else. We have a visitor uh, here at the church this weekend that's talking. A gentleman came from Las Vegas to come and speak. And so when I went uh, into my office to get my little tripod for the camera, he was standing in my office. And so my office, the computer's on. It's got a couple of screens and it's running my screensaver, which has a whole bunch of LA Kings logos scrolling through from throughout the years. Because why wouldn't you? So he says, LA Kings, huh? And I said, same thing I just said to you. I said, yeah, why wouldn't you? Of course, LA Kings. What else could I put on there? Well, you could like other teams. And I said, what would be the point? I like this one team and this one team alone. I'm not going to cheer for two teams. What if they play each other? Then what do I do? I cheer for one team. And God is the only place that I'm going to find rest. It's the only way 
that my soul is going to get comforted. Nowhere else. Not my habit, not my hurt, not my hang up. It feels like it for a time. But then the next morning, not so much. By admitting that we are powerless, we're able to believe and receive God's power to help us recover. By admitting that I am powerless, I am able to believe and receive God's power to help me recover. I've got to be able to do this. If I come up here and tell you something that I'm not willing to do, you should get up and leave. If I'm not doing the things that I'm telling you should be done, why would you listen to me? Throw a chair at me, take my coffee machine, tell me to go pound sand and see me later. Because it's just useless. I'm telling you right here and right now, I love my wife and she is a wonderful person. But she can't save me. God, Jesus Christ, is the only power that's going to be able to to make me succeed. White knuckles only add stress and make me tired. They work for a season, but not forever. Jesus does not let me down. I think I'm gonna start saying something different and I'm sorry for, for changing what, what Celebrate Recovery has spent all this time working, but I don't think I want Jesus to be my higher power. I want him to be my highest power. Nothing else above him because that's all I need. The second principle leads me to the knowledge that Christ is the one true higher power. God wants to fill my life with his love, with his joy, with his presence. I was made to be God's friend. It's a partnership. Next time I think I'm not useful or worthy, I just need to remember, God was so bored, he made me. God could make anything he wanted. God made the mountains, he made the sunshine, he made the sunrise and the sunset. God made Hawaii. God made hockey, people. And he created me because he was bored. And I have it on really good authority that of all the people on the entire planet, you are God's favorite, and so am I. That's how much he loves us. That's how worthy you are. Yes. That's why I'm willing to be here every Friday night for you. Are there better things I could do? Nope. Are there other things? Yep. But nothing better. Nothing has changed my life like Jesus. And no one has changed my life like you folks. Today we're looking at hope. Four points, an H, an O, a P, and an E. If we're playing Scrabble, it looks like it's worth about uh, nine points. But we're only gonna make four of them. I like to think of principle two as the hope principle. Because that's what we're looking for is hope. And hope is not a random wish. That's not what I mean when I say hope. When you hear me say hope, it's not like, oh, I hope I win the lottery. No, you wish you won the lottery. Hope is where I can see something and that's what I'm getting. That's my hope in the future and Jesus provides me with that hope. So the H in hope is higher power. We've said it before and we'll keep on saying it. Jesus Christ is the only higher power that we will deal with here at Celebrate Recovery. If you want another higher power, there are other groups for you to go to. And you are welcome to do that. But here, Celebrate Recovery, it's Jesus. Here's a verse from Romans. This is 1136. It says, everything comes from God alone. Everything lives by his power. God's like the coach. I love several things in life. I love my wife. I love my family. I love coffee. I love donuts. I love hockey. Hockey, yeah, that's right. 75 bonus points right there. Go to the head of the class. Uh, 
In hockey, they're constantly jumping over the boards, going onto the ice and jumping off the ice, coming back to the bench. They don't stop the game for it. It happens while the puck is moving. And the way they know they're going onto the ice is the coach will walk behind them and he'll tap them on the back. You're going in, you're going in, you're going in. Duck, duck, goose, but it's king, king, king. We don't want ducks. Don't bring that mess in here. Man, alive. Wow. Yeah. So God is like our coach. He's tapping me and putting me back in the game. He's the power that lets me succeed. Otherwise, I'm just sitting on the bench. God's the one that gives me the power to get in there. Jesus desires from me a hands-on, day-to-day, moment-to-moment relationship. Remember when you met that certain special someone and you just wanted to spend all your time with them? You just couldn't not spend time? Maybe you get engaged on Valentine's Day. I don't know. Uh, uh, that's the way God is. All the time. He didn't get bored with us. He gets bored without us. He wants intimacy. But God's not a micromanager. God's not walking around pushing every little button in my life. God's given me the opportunity to succeed through any failures that I have. But if God was a micromanager and God did everything and made everything that I do is because God did it, that means that when I was acting out, when I was breaking the law, when I was in the midst of my troubles, that was God doing it. And that is absolutely not true. That was me doing it. That was me not accepting God's intimacy. God wants me to be there all the time, but he won't micromanage me. He will let me fall. Think about what we talk about in principle two. We came to believe. It's easy to believe our doubts and doubt our beliefs. You don't see the wind, but you see the effects of the wind. I was walking in my backyard yesterday and somebody's roof is in my backyard. There's, there's shingles in my yard. I was thinking it was mine, but it's not. Yay. But somebody's missing some, some, some shingles. I couldn't see that wind, but I can see what happened because of it. There's a line in a song. It says, I've never seen my congressman, yet I know that he exists because I've seen his name on the ballot list. It's a process, people. We have to come to believe. It's not a magic pill. It's not just an instant flash boom. It can be. I'm not saying there's not instant transformations, but so much evidence shows me that the way that God tends to do it is by letting us do it, by letting us work through it. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. My grace is enough for you. Wow, it's almost like we sang a song like that. For where there is weakness, my power is shown the more completely. After careful consideration, after doubt, after reasoning, and after concluding, we have come to believe these things. The O in hope is openness. I need to have the openness to change what's wrong in my life. I need to have the openness to change the things that I have not been doing in a proper fashion. Listen, if you're perfect, see ya. You don't need to be here. And if you're not perfect, welcome. So if you're here and you're staying, that means we're admitting that there's something wrong. So when someone tells me what's wrong, when somebody sees this is what I see in your life, I don't have to like it. I don't even have to listen. But it sure would do me some good if I'm willing to be open to change some things in my life. Look at those first four words again. We came to believe. We, us, you, me, all of us, this forever family right here, we came. We took a step, the first step, when we attended our first meeting, then our second step, then our third step. We came to, 
It was a purpose and a process. We had a reason for doing what we were doing. We had a reason for coming here. Maybe somebody brought you. Okay. Maybe you heard there was great coffee. Okay. Maybe you heard there was a really handsome person. Sorry, it's me. <laughs> we stopped denying our hurts, our habits, and our hangups. We came to believe. We started to believe and receive God's help and power in allowing us to recover. Hope is openness to change. At first, it can be scary. And even after many, many years, I can tell you that sometimes I get scared by the change. If you read my blog this week, you know that sometimes I get scared by the change. Sometimes things aren't hunky-dory. And even though I know the past is bad, sometimes I'm more comfortable dealing with the pain that I understand than trying to be brave enough to face a change. I talk a lot about the students that I used to teach. And one that really stands out in my mind is Andrew. And you may have heard me talk about Andrew before. Andrew was a kid who was always in trouble. And he came to my class and he was a troublemaker. And Andrew knew when he caused trouble, he would get sent to the principal's office. That's how it worked. I taught fifth grade, so by this time, he's been doing it for many, many years. He understands the process. So he would throw something out for me and he would look at me and wait for me to send him to the principal. So I didn't. I'm stubborn. I don't like to give people what they want. So I just made him sit there. He got kind of uncomfortable because this is not how it works, man. So he throws out some more nonsense and I ignore some more nonsense. And then at recess, I call him over and I'm like, dude, what is up? He's like, well, I know, I'm just, this is, I'm just a, I, I'm a, I'm a troublemaker. And I said, okay, so what? Well, you should send me to the principal's office. I said, why? How are you gonna learn in there? Why don't you stay here with me? Cause all the trouble you want. I can handle it. I'm a big boy. So over time, Andrew learned a new way of doing things. Don't cause trouble, start succeeding. He went from getting solid D's and C's to the B's to the A's. By the time the new year rolled around and we're in January and February, Andrew is starting to get elected as class president for the month. People are starting to look up to him because he's succeeding. He's got brains. He's been smart enough to outsmart all of his teachers up to this point. That's how intelligent this guy was. So he's doing great. People are liking him. Then it starts to get uncomfortable. He doesn't know what to do with the success. And even though he likes the success and he likes the fact that he's doing well and his teacher loves him, he can't handle it and he starts to self-destruct. He just goes back to those habits that he knew because he hadn't gotten rid of the hangups. And so when one thing went wrong somewhere else in life, he just defaulted back to that natural behavior of trying to be in trouble. I do that. I know what I should do and I know the right things, but sometimes it's easier to just turn around and go back to where I was. Because even though it's not good, I know where it is. I know when I'm gonna get punched in the face. It's not a surprise. And honestly, sometimes those hugs and congratulations, they feel a lot more awkward than just a good straight punch in the face that I can understand. We're here to get better, not bitter. We gotta be open to the change. Ephesians 4.23, now your attitudes and thoughts must all be constantly changing for the better. You must be a new and different person. My friend Mark is always saying, tell yourself a better story, man. There's the challenge, new and different. How fantastic is that? They print that on boxes all the time. 
New and improved. You're going to be new and improved, people. They're going to move you to the front of the shelf. Maybe even put you on an end cap with a big sign. The P is the power to change. We've got to be open to change. But that's not good enough. We've got to have the power to change. This is how we become that new and different person. Philippians 4.13, For I can do everything God asks me with the help of Christ who gives me strength and power. I can do all things through him. Yeah, buddy. All things. I can stand up in front of people or sit on a stool and talk. I'm comfortable with talking. You may not have noticed that. But when I first started leading CR and the person who did music left and all of a sudden they looked to me, I'm like, what? <laughs> me? I don't know about that. I was not comfortable. Now I just let her rip. Whatever. Because I can do it because Christ gives me the power. A lot of people say we're given what we don't deserve. I disagree. Jesus died for me. And I do deserve the grace that God lavishes on me. If I say anything different, I am mocking and minimizing that great sacrifice. David said, lead me, teach me, for you are the God who gives me salvation. I have no hope except in you. Jesus was, a, or David was a little sheep herder out playing with the sheep. Then he goes up and he goes to battle against this guy who was a lifelong warrior and kills him. And he becomes the king. All these things that David did, right? Wrong. He recognized God gave him the power. I got nothing but you. There is no wiggle room in the statement. No hope except in you. I've tried a lot of different ways to find success. In my acting out, I was trying to replace God with my own actions. And it doesn't work and it didn't work. When I'm walking in him, the natural byproduct of me being with God is relief and joy. Now, just because I have relief from God and I have joy from God doesn't mean everything is wonderful. My son still lives in a car. I have a job, but just barely. Everything is not awesome, according to the song it is, but that's just not true. But everything is all right, because God gives me that peace to know, I don't know where it's coming from, but I know it's coming. So I'm not going to worry about where it's coming from. I just know that it's coming. E is expect to change. We're open to change. We have the power to change. So by golly, I should expect to change. Remember, I'm only at step two and principle two. I can't quit before the miracles happen here, okay? Just because I mix the ingredients and put it in a pan and I put that pan in the oven, it doesn't mean I have a cake. I gotta wait. I gotta spend some time baking to have that cake change from an ooey gooey mess to something that is just wonderful. But we can and we should expect to change. Philippians, this is a Philippians heavy uh, lesson today. I don't apologize, I just acknowledge. Philippians 1, 6. I am sure that God who began the good work within you, God began a good work yes, did. within you. I am sure that the God who began the good work within you will keep right on helping you grow in his grace until his task within you is finally finished on that day when Christ returns. Yes. Not tomorrow, people. On the day that Christ returns. So if you wake up and Christ still isn't here and you're still a little bit miserable, ta-da! <laughs> That's what he told us was going to happen. 
He also said he's going to give us the power to get through. Matthew 17, 20. If you had faith, even as small as a tiny mustard seed, you could say this to this mountain, move, and it would go far away. Nothing would be impossible. We don't need much in order to do much. You ever put a microwave or a marshmallow in a microwave? A little tiny thing. <laughs> My faith is the marshmallow. God is the microwave. Hebrews 11.1, 1. faith is being sure of what we see. I'm sorry, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Faith is the avenue to salvation. We started by making a decision based on reason and thought, but we continue by leaning on faith. Romans 10.9 says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. One more time. Jesus Christ, our one and only higher power. Put your trust in him. Relinquish your power to him. Put your hope in him. Not me. Not the band, not your phone, in Jesus. Thanks for listening. Let's stand and do our serenity prayer and we'll uh, bust a move for small groups. Yeah, <laughs> just bust a move. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, taking, as Jesus did, this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. Amen. All right, guys, uh, we're going to be, the, the men will be down uh, the hall where we typically are. Ladies, you'll be right here. Thanks for being here. Uh, bathrooms and coffee at nine. See you later, Internet. The Celebrate Recovery Show is produced by Paul Pippin for RCA Go using materials by John Baker and Rick Warren. For more information, email cr at rcachurch.